it's easy to watch the news and maybe see a report on melting polar ice caps, something like that. But that doesn't tell you a lot about what's gonna happen in your own backyard. And that's what we do. That's our whole job. If we're not here, there's no one here to translate what climate change, which is a global phenomenon, means for the low country. Climate change is the most important issue that Charleston faces in, in the short and long term. Climate change affects our very viability as a city. It will affect our economy more and more. It will affect our quality of life. It'll affect our beauty. A sunny day nuisance flooding that used to happen sporadically now in 2019, that happened 89 times, which was a record. It was like one out of five days in Charleston encountered flooding. The Post and Courier is a statewide paper, but it's also a local paper. We live in these communities, right? We're feeling the same effects as all of our readers are. So we have you know, just as much motivation as anyone to cover what's going on and to prepare people for the future and educate them on things that we could do now uh, to maybe make some of those effects less in the coming years. We've taken deep dives into everything from the plight of ocean plankton to a bird that is practically invisible to the naked eye. Stories like that reflect our determination to identify important environmental issues and do them in a way that creates change. So in reporting on climate change, we cover a lot of the effects of climate change, hotter temperatures, higher oceans, but we've also written about clean energy, right? About those carbon emissions that are actually causing this. Oftentimes the ideas come from readers who, who just encounter some issue, don't understand why it's happening, but it's impacting their lives and they don't know what to do about it. We know where to look, we know who to ask, we know how to use the power of our institution to get the answers, to get the documents. Our readers understand the importance of what we're doing because these stories really affect our, our readers in a, both an economic and a quality of life way that, that few other stories do. We have a presence not only in Charleston, but in Columbia, in Myrtle Beach, in Greenville, uh, and, and folks scattered in between. And we're in the best position to tell these stories, and we have a talented staff that understands the science. So journalism is a fundamental pillar of our democracy. So our job as journalists is to empower people with accurate, balanced information that helps them make those kinds of decisions that benefit themselves and their family and their communities overall. It's about the people who live here in their lives um, and just trying to translate this very big idea of climate change into what's going to happen in your backyard. And I think people can see that and they appreciate that. We're really doing this work on behalf of our readers and, and, and to hopefully make their lives better. Thank you all for supporting us and joining us today. Um, PJ Browning, President and Publisher of the Post and Courier. And over lunch today, we're gonna to talk about some of the details that went into some of this reporting. Um, and we're really fortunate to have a couple of our reporters uh, with us today to talk about those details. Um, you know, we've always been able to do the really deep, impactful projects because of the support from our subscribers and from our advertisers, so thank you. Um, in addition, this year, some of the projects have also been supported through our new public service fund uh, for investigative reporting that we set up through the Coastal Community Foundation. Um, you may have seen the fund highlighted uh, and wondered what that was. Uh, we have put that in just as an awareness uh, behind some of our more in-depth reports. Uh, we do appreciate the support that we get from you. It allows us to do the things that we're very passionate about on behalf of the communities that we serve. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our managing editor, Autumn Phillips. Thanks, PJ. So thanks for joining us on your lunch hour. It might feel like you're just sitting on your computer at your desk or 
uh, at your kitchen table alone, but we actually had 226 people uh, sign up to attend this today. Uh, and when you signed up, you got a chance to uh, submit a question. I got uh, three pages of uh, good questions. Uh, I'll scatter out uh, throughout our conversation today. And then if you look at the bottom of your Zoom, you'll see there's a Q&A function, uh, two little bubbles. Uh, feel free as people are talking, you have a question, put it in there, it'll get passed to me. Um, and, you know, throughout the conversation, I'll, uh, I'll ask some of those questions too. So we're here today to talk about our environmental uh, reporting. Um, we're going to start by talking about rising waters. If you picked up Sunday's paper, that was the conclusion uh, for the year of a, a project that we started um, early in the year. Uh, to focus in an in-depth way on uh, flooding. So at the end of 2019, we saw that it had flooded in downtown Charleston 89 times. That is one out of every five days. When we did that math, it just sparked a real sense of urgency that it's time to put a magnifying glass on this issue. So we tried something different. We spent months doing reporting, collecting all this information, writing these in-depth stories, and then we sat on them. So uh, we held on to all this information and we waited for those moments which came inevitably again and again and again when Charleston flooded. And that's when we deployed these stories. We sent reporters out, uh, they collected more information from the day and we rewrote these project uh, length stories uh, and published them, you know, in the moment as cars were stalling on the streets, traffic was backed up, people were pushing water out of their um, living rooms. Uh, anyway, so it was, uh, you know, we got better at it as we went, but it, it was a very uh, difficult task. Uh, but it was also really exciting way to learn to communicate uh, big ideas exactly when it was on people's mind. So uh, we're not done with uh, rising waters. We're going to keep reporting what we've learned. You know, the more you learn, the more you know there is to learn um, and there are more solutions to explore. So we'll continue this reporting. Uh, we have a great team of project reporters, environmental reporters, and I have two of them here. Uh, Tony Bartlemay and Chloe Johnson. I'm going to uh, interview them. We're going to talk about um, rising waters uh, and some of our other um, environmental projects. So uh, let's start with you, Tony. Um, you want to introduce yourself a little bit and then uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you learned from uh, you know, this last story, especially that you published in the Rising Waters Project about the loss um, of our tree canopy and how that plays into uh, flooding in Charleston. Thanks, Autumn. Thanks, uh, PJ. And hi, everybody. I'm Tony Bartleman. and I'm uh, a projects reporter here at the Post and Courier. I've been here for uh, more than 28 years, I guess. And so Rising Waters, you know, is is an interesting project because one of the most difficult challenges when it comes to reporting on an incredibly important incremental story like climate change is how to engage readers in a, in a meaningful way. And so I don't know about you, but when I come across a story that says that there's gonna be a catastrophe in the future, I tend to turn away and I'm really into this climate change stuff. So, the beauty of rising waters is that it's all about the now. It's about what's happening now and in the past. And what we did was we deeply reported uh, stories uh, and then embedded those contextual stories when our minds were trained on a flood or a heavy rain or an unusually high tide. And so our most our latest and last installment for this year was about changes in the tree canopy in Charleston over time. And that was really important because that is, is a marker of sorts of, of, about how, of, of how bad an area can flood. If you lose a lot of trees, you tend to increase a lot of flooding because trees are these awesome pumps. 
And so we worked very closely with the College of Charleston for months on a first ever tool to examine how tree, tree canopy, uh, tree cover had changed since 1992. And we, the results were, were startling. We, we discovered that more than 10,800 acres of tree cover had been lost in the Charleston metro area uh, since 1992. And that's equivalent to 8,200 football fields. So it was a, 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 a revelation that I think will help uh, planners, residents, target uh, their, their policies uh, moving forward. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Chloe, I have a question for you. Early in the year, uh, we ran a story about subsidence. It was one of our most uh, popular stories in this series. Um, the idea, I'm gonna have you explain it uh, better than me, but the idea uh, is that it, yes, the seas are rising, but also the land is sinking. Do you wanna to talk to us more about that? Yeah, I mean, this is an example of a story that um, really came in large part from readers in the public, right? So we write all the time about tidal flooding, sea level rise, sort of what that means to the region. Um, but, you know, every so often you get a person who says, well, the land's sinking too, you know, why don't you write about that? And so we decided, yes, absolutely, we need to write about that. Um, and that was a fascinating story. You know, I ended up talking to um, scientists and researchers from all around the region, really generous with their time. And, you know, what I found is there are absolutely places where buildings may be sinking into the ground, right? You know, we can have um, not terribly suitable soil in many places around the region. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on this webinar have seen the Halsey map, which is a historical map of where there used to be creeks on the Charleston Peninsula, and those are areas that tend to be low-lying and flood-prone today. Um, but systematically across the region, we do not have a massive issue with subsidence, um, which is in, in a sense kind of a good thing because when you add subsidence to sea level rise, you get what a researcher would call relative sea level rise. So were we sinking super fast across the entire region, um, that would make the situation far worse. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed doing that story because I think some of our best pieces in the series have come from like natural curiosity and just things that we observe and that readers observe and, you know, we get to shine a bit of a spotlight on it. Chloe, uh, I actually have a question from one of our uh, viewers. How close is the city of Charleston enacting ordinances based on recommendations uh, from the Dutch dialogue? That's a good question. Um, so the city has been doing a couple of things already. They're revising their stormwater rules. Um, there's specific rules that have always, already been put in place for the Church Creek area, which I think was um, kind of a big part of Tony's tree story, actually. Um, that, that's an area where there's been a lot of deforestation um, that's been part of the impacts here. You know, it's, it's, it, it's a slow process. And I think, I think folks at the city are doing their best to um, implement those recommendations. At the same time, there have been things that haven't necessarily gotten super far. Um, you know, there was at one point an idea that maybe you don't truck in dirt to fill house lots um, in the city of Charleston, um, which has not really gained a ton of purchase so far. Um, the biggest thing, and I think it's still not 100% clear to a lot of people how this fits into the Dutch dialogues is um, the Army Corps Peninsula Protection Project, which has suggested putting a seawall around the city. So a lot of energy has been there recently. A lot of energy is gonna be there next year because um, we're gonna get some updates on that plan soon. All right, thanks, Chloe. Uh, Tony, this one for, is for you. So uh, we did get some funding this year from the Pulitzer Foundation. Uh, in order to test the floodwaters. So as it flooded, we sent out uh, reporters with vials um, and collected flood waters all over uh, the peninsula and north. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we learned from that? How gross was it? 
it was disgusting. So it, this was a very challenging uh, set of stories. So we timed it to a flood. So what this meant was we watched the weather uh, very closely for a, what I call a rain bomb, you know, a, a very strong uh, storm that might drop four or five inches in a few hours. And so we would watch for these, these big storms. And then as soon as it got to a certain level of flooding, and that might be up to, you know, my thighs outside my house, uh, we would dash into the floodwaters, we'd get on our, our waders. And, and I remember one time, you know, I was, my raincoat fell apart as I was walking through these floodwaters and we're carrying these little vials and we collect the samples. And then we, you know, in the midst of all that, I've, I had to push a car out of the way and, and it's raining all over the place. And then somehow collect all these samples from all the other reporters who were collecting the, these really disgusting waters. And then haul up the lads into the lab before it closed because they needed the, the, the samples before 4 p.m. or they wouldn't be able to process them that, that day and also write a story. And we did this in a matter of two or three hours, and it was a logistical challenge. And the results were fascinating, though. We found just in sky high levels of bacteria, um, disease carrying bacteria in our waters, exposing a public health threat that really we had never really been looked at that carefully in the past. It was the, like the amazing race uh, poop yeah. episode. Uh, hey, Tony, before I forget to ask, so this uh, event ends at 1, and then at 1.30, the Understand SC podcast goes live, uh, and you've been interviewed about the Rising Waters Project. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we've got this great podcast called Understand South Carolina, and I'll, we'll talk a little uh, in a little more depth about uh, the, the Rising Waters Project, the why behind it, and and some of the results. And you can find that podcast on all the podcast players like Google and Spotify and Apple. Great. Yeah, so Understand SC, this week it's about rising waters. Uh, we put out one a week uh, on Thursdays about uh, an in-depth look, a conversation about our coverage in case you aren't um, a subscriber to the podcast. I, okay, I have a couple uh, questions. This is from uh, somebody submitted when they were signing up. This is uh, for Tony. So while Charles, Charlestonians are very concerned with flooding and sea level rise, do you think our local governments and institutions are adequately addressing the root cause of these issues through climate action? So the root cause of these, uh, of the impacts is the release of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases. So uh, that, is what is ultimately driving the warmer, the warmer air, the warmer ocean temperatures, the melting on the polar ice caps. So the question is, are we, are we as a community addressing that? And that's something we did as a little bit of a prequel uh, earlier this year. We we looked at the city of Charleston's carbon footprint and um, took a look at it, whether or not they had had really done their part. And we found we really well. They have a lot of good intentions and, uh, and then our staffers are really trying hard to do something. They really hadn't done much. So it was a little bit of an accountability piece. So I, you know, the facts sort of speak for themselves. The, the, uh, all of our cities are, are really um, not doing that much. All right, I have, uh, I have one from Chloe. This, um, this came from someone as they were signing up. In fact, several readers asked a version of this question. Uh, what is the expected impact on homes outside the proposed Charleston seawall? Uh, we haven't talked about uh, that much yet, but we've done quite a bit of reporting. Chloe, you want to fill people in on the seawall if they don't know yeah. much about it and then address the question? Yeah, I mean, this, is, this has been a really hot topic um, since it was first unveiled in April. So the Army Corps of Engineers, the local Charleston district office, um, has been working on a study since, I think, 2018, maybe early 2019. Um, and the purpose of the study is to look at how do you protect the Charleston Peninsula from hurricane surge. Um, so in April, they sort of released their first version of what they say we should do. 
and that is an eight mile wall that would go around the peninsula. Um, it would be sort of shorter in some places, higher in others. I think the peak height off the ground is really about eight feet. It's like 12 feet from mean sea level or so. Um, so, you know, this barrier, which again encircles pretty much all of the lower peninsula, there are some areas on the edges that are outside it. We've written about that too. Um, a lot of people have been wondering if you have a wall that stops water, you know, tidal water from getting into Charleston, does it then push it into Mount Pleasant, James Island, West Ashley, all of those places? Um, which, you know, is a really relevant question. Um, the answer is we don't know yet how big that effect is. Um, there's going to be some effect, but will it be noticeable? Um, that's not at all clear to me. I know that the core is working literally right now on modeling um, to try and characterize how big of an effect it will be. Um, so we're going to get more answers about that next year. This is a story that I've been following extremely closely since the spring, um, in part with my colleague Michaela Porter. And um, there's going to be a lot more to come on that essentially, which I know is frustrating because everyone in those places wants to know what's going to happen. Um, but realistically, the answer is we don't have the full picture yet. Uh, this is a question also about the seawall. Chloe just came into uh, from uh, someone in the event. Uh, can you give us any idea of what a seawall might look like or how it would affect harbor access and the creeks? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, what was not, you know, the Army Corps, when they released this draft plan, it's like a 400 page report, right? And, and me and Michaela Porter were reading it the first day it came out, we split it up, um, we're analyzing it, trying to figure out what all the implications were. And it did not become clear to me until later that there's gonna be like dozens of gates um, potentially in this wall that would stay open probably most of the time. So those are gates um, where the wall would bisect a road or a pedestrian path. Um, those are also potentially gates over tidal creeks. Um, and some federal agencies have already commented on the plan and it's a major concern of theirs that we still have that tidal flow, you know, where there are creeks still in Charleston. So this is something that, you know, other parties, the federal government is already looking at um, and, and talking about. Um, so the idea is that you maintain those transportation routes. Um, the rub is when you have a tidal event, right, you have to decide what is the point at which we close this gate. So I think clearly if a hurricane is coming, um, that's what it's designed for. All those goods, your gates are gonna end up closing around the city. Um, what is less clear is, is there a tidal event that's less than a hurricane? Um, you know, maybe a really, really severe king tide event that also prompts the city to close the gates. So um, that is gonna be a big part of developing this proposal going forward. You know, you have to figure out how you build this thing where it goes. You also have to figure out how you operate it. Um, the other question I believe was about the appearance of the wall. Um, it's also f kind of a frustrating answer, which is we don't know yet. I mean, there are pictures of what these types of walls look like in other places. Um, we published a story a few months back um, in which I talked to Joshua Robinson, who's a local sort of hydrology engineering guy. And he had um, actually scaled down pictures of these types of walls and put them in recognizable locations like Brittle Bank Park. So that, that's an idea, um, but with the caveat that the city has said through the entire process that their goal is to beautify the wall and make it fit in particular with some of the more historic sections of the city. So when you see those renderings, they are like the absolute base appearance of these walls um, with the city saying, you know, we want to improve it, put walkways on it, you know, give access kind of like is on the battery right now, maybe over a larger portion of the city. Uh, Chloe, I have uh, another question for you that just came in from uh, a participant. Can you address if there's any coordination between the city of Charleston and surrounding counties uh, to address flooding in other areas? That's a great question. So the biggest example of sort of regional cooperation, coordination I've seen is actually a drain cleaning program 
that was started by um, State Senator Sandy Sen. Um, so you can call staff at her office and say, hey, this drain is clogged. And it's really useful because you may not know if the drain outside your house is like owned by DOT, the city of Charleston, the county of Charleston, that's often a point of confusion. In terms of regional planning, because I know there's a lot of question about development pushing water across city boundaries. Um, we've seen a lot of discussion. We've had, you know, additionally a state flood water commission that I've reported on um, that talks about this idea a lot. I'm not really seeing it enshrined in many places or codified. Um, that, that's a little bit slow to develop, I think. Thanks. We got a comment uh, as we're talking. Someone suggested the city of Charleston has a climate action plan. Uh, it's being updated now and can be found online if people are interested. Um, and before I forget to say, and before we move on to uh, some other reporting, uh, if you want to read any of our rising water stories that published throughout the year and as we continue, uh, postandcourier.com forward slash rising waters. We have it all collected in one place. Uh, pretty proud of it. Okay, Chloe, um, another thing that you've been working on this year uh, is newsletters. So we launched, last year we launched Hurricane Wire, which uh, goes live in June and ends at the end of hurricane season, uh, that moving date uh, in October, early November. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? And then also you can give everyone a preview of the new newsletter that we're launching uh, on climate change that will begin in February. Yeah, Hurricane Wire is a great newsletter. Um, our other environmental reporter, Shamira McRae, is our lead writer right now. She's new to us this year, but she's been doing a really great job. Um, and it's a collaboration. We have fresh graphics in there. Every issue, we talk about, you know, what's the forecast in the Atlantic and what should we expect in the coming days. And then we also usually have a feature story um, about tropical weather. Um, really exciting, though, that we are going to be branching out into a climate environment newsletter um, in the new year that I'm going to write. Um, which is great because I really miss writing newsletters. Um, and I'm so excited to get into like some of the nerdier stuff. You know, I get questions sometimes like, how does the Charleston tidal gauge work? Um, how do we know this reading is correct? Stuff like that. Um, so if anyone, you know, ever has a question about my story, I love explaining my work to people. Um, and I think that newsletter is going to be a great place to, to show off some of that as well. Um. Tony, let's uh, go to you. Uh, let's talk about your ghost bird project. That published in October, um, you were invited um, to follow uh, research and a search for a tiny little bird that lives in the marsh. Do you wanna tell us how you found that story, uh, what you learned and um, share a little bit about the impact that story had? Sure, sure thing, uh, we call this this project ghost bird and I, I loved working on it and I love telling talking about how it happened to it, it it began with like a lot of stories do with a tip in this case from um, a person at, at the Department of Natural Resources who had seen our work on the Santee Delta we'd done a project taking a look at the history and the, the, the threats to the Santee Delta when it was called our secret Delta and they saw how the depth that we had done that story and I said, you know what, Tony, we've got this great story. It's about uh, this bird. I was kind of like, well, a bird. I, I really don't like birds. I mean, I like birds, you know, they're cool. But I didn't know much about birds. I'm not a birder. Um, but she said, this bird is very rare and it's almost invisible. And it lives in this fragile edge between land and, and sea. And that edge is shrinking because of climate change. And oh, by the way, the scientist has become a world, uh, world re kind of renowned expert in this. And she's absolutely terrified of telling her story because she's afraid that if we do do a story, people will harm the bird. But if we don't, we won't save it. So I ended up um, saying, hey, let's just sit down and have a conversation with the scientist. And, and 
and just see how, how it goes. And in the meantime, I had told my seven-year-old granddaughter that I was working on a story potentially about an invisible bird. And then you know, she was in the back seat of the car and she immediately took a piece of paper and scribbled this, this little picture here. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of camouflaged and uh, uh, it's kind of fitting that you can't see it. But she wrote this little, did this little picture of, of the invisible bird and I took it with me we sat down and that immediately, I think, put the scientist at ease. And, and then from there, we did this, this really deep dive into a story about the Eastern Black Rail. And it really wasn't just a story about an endangered species. It was, it was a story about obsession and mystery and the tension that the scientist felt between protecting the bird and sharing her love for the bird. So when you kind of get to these sort of universal themes of obsession and love, you can write about anything. And so we did that. And we, it, was a, it was a big production. We, 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 we published the first videos of the, of, of the bird in its mysterious habitat. And a few weeks later, uh, the US Forest, uh, Forest Service listed the bird as a threatened species. And it was one of only two species that were protected this year. So um, that's one way to tell a story. Uh, I, you know, one of the things I admire about you, Tony, is, is your way of finding these creative ways to tell these complicated uh, science stories. Um, Two years ago, was it 2018, uh, we published a great project about the Gulf Stream. And you found an interesting entry point into that story. Uh, and by the end, we all had a very deep understanding of how the Gulf Stream worked and how uh, climate change was shifting it. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, that's, so that also gets back to how we tell these, in, these very complicated stories about climate change. And sometimes, sometimes you want to just hit people over the head with a, you know, a story and it's, you know, with all the facts and other times fears maybe will, will scare people away. So in, in, when it's the appropriate subject, you want to kind of ease people into a story. And for this story that we called Into the Gulf Stream, I actually began with an anecdote uh, about Ben Franklin, and his discovery of the Gulf Stream. And then kind of folded, it, it, it evolves into a much deeper story about how the Gulf Stream is this mighty river just off our coast, and that actually pulls this this uh, pulls the sea, the ocean away from our coast, effectively lowering our our sea level. But because of a rapidly warming planet, this current is actually being impeded and slowing down. So if that slows down, our 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 sea level actually increases more than it would otherwise. So that. This is one of those one of those great stories that that had been neglected by the national media. Uh, it was being talked about intensely in, um, in the scientific community, but because of its complexity, it's one of those really hard stories to tell and unless you really really build in a lot of context, engaging context, interesting crazy anecdotes. So we 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 and love that was a very popular story uh, about a very complicated subject. Thanks, Tony. All right, we're getting tons of questions uh, from people on the event, which is great. I'm going to uh, try to get through quite a few of them. Um, this is a good question for Chloe. Uh, we got actually people who are signing up for the event asked similar questions about pushback. Uh, um, this one says, have you received a pushback from uh, developers, uh, et cetera? Uh, from the Rising Water series? I mean, I, I, it's a short answer. I haven't really experienced that. Um, yeah. I don't, I, I can't speak to that really at all. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> uh, but he, here's another kind of pushback. Uh, same, similar question. Uh, and this was submitted from uh, someone as they were signing up. Uh, is your job harder in the current political climate? Uh, do many readers question the facts you present? 
Yeah, that's a really excellent question. I mean, you know, I'm a journalist and I deal in facts, right? I mean, that's my job is to give readers good information that I'm confident is accurate. Um, so what that means is, uh, you know, I'm bringing readers the scientific consensus um, and I'm, the scientific consensus is what Tony was talking about earlier that CO2 and methane that's going into the atmosphere um, is warming the planet, you know, warming temperatures on land, warming the temperature of the ocean. Um, it's been observed in many different ways. You know, we have a hometown tidal gauge. We also have satellites that measure um, the height of the oceans too around the globe, as well as a whole bunch of other gauges in other places. Um, so, you know, like I, I think I said this earlier on the newsletter question, but if someone asks me a question about my work, I am more than happy to sort of explain how I arrived at, you know, what I've reported. Um, and everything I report is coming from a source, right? It's not coming from anywhere else. It's coming from local scientists or peer reviewed work or, you know, something of that nature that I can report out what's happening. And personally, I mean, I think it's extremely important to be realistic, right, about where scientific consensus is. Science does does change over time, right? Maybe we learn new things or things we didn't expect. But um, in terms of like the global warming process that we've laid out, um, there is so much agreement on that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's not always as much agreement on exactly how it's going to play out, right? Like even NOAA has a whole bunch of different scenarios for how much the sea level is going to rise, right? Um, there's a lot of questions in tropical meteorology about how climate is affecting hurricanes. Um, will we have more hurricanes? Not necessarily, you know, that's a discussion that's in process. Um, and my approach is to say like, you know, people are still hashing this out. People are still um, figuring out what we think might happen. So, you know, that that's the way I deal with it. Um, I'm again, always happy to answer questions about my work, but I'm just doing my best to translate the science. I'll, I'll also add, add yeah. something. Um, um, we, we actually dealt with that head on in rising waters. We, mm -hmm. the, the, the one comment that we often get is, you know, the climate change, climate change, the climate's always changed. Mm -hmm. And so very, very quickly, we, we, we said the story really isn't about the climate changing, of course, the climate's always changed. The story here is that the climate is changing faster. And that's, that's the impact right now, the pace of change. And we had to honor that, that skepticism and because of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we took that approach, Tony, that you took that approach on that story. Um, Cause you know, the, the sea level has been really different, you know, over the history of the earth. I mean, that's, we know that um, we've been able to measure that. It used to be where Columbia is now. Um, so yeah, absolutely. The climate has changed before, but you're right. It is, it is a rate problem. It is the speed at which it's happening. Uh, here's another question. Uh, Chloe, if you want to take this one, this came from uh, a participant as they were signing up. Uh, why do planners continue to the, ignore the cumulative con contributions of development to flooding? So I don't want to characterize them as ignoring it because I don't know for sure that's what's happening. But I think kind of like I said before, um, you know, city officials and planners are working to incorporate some of the stuff that we've learned in the past couple of years, right? Including in the Dutch dialogues. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it should be made clear that, you know, this region has had a really serious couple of years, right? Charleston has a long history of flooding, but I mean, since the 2015 flood, um, which impacted the state all the way up to, you know, Columbia, right? Um, we have had such a series of really serious storms. Um, and that kind of underlines these problems in a way that they might not be as obvious, I guess, or as top of mind um, mm -hmm. in periods when we're in like a relative drought. So uh, that's just something to think about. I think this is on the top of everyone's minds in part because we have had just such a like anomalous almost stretch of, you know, flooding and severe weather in the past couple of years. I'll also, also add that the planners, they're, they're in this ongoing tug of war with 
with companies, very well-heeled companies and people who want to make money off, off the land and develop it and possibly create some, some, some flooding issues. And it's our job as, as journalists to observe that tug of war, make sure that everybody understands there's a tug of war. And you know, I think when, when that observation is done properly, you get a more balanced response. Thanks, Tony. Uh, this is a question, I get, well, this is a question for me. We, uh, we've been having this conversation a lot and this kind of goes back to some of the things we were, you were talking about with your approach to the ghost bird or your approach to the Gulf Stream. So um, you're writing about something that is an existential threat. Um, we can sense that the climate's changing. We can see it as a, in the sunny day flooding. Um, but how do you write stories um, that help people understand what is to come without filling them with fear and dread, uh, but also inspiring them uh, to react? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I think you need to be realistic about what's coming, because if you're not, you're, you're doing a disservice to the readers. Um, but also you need to offer solutions, right, ways forward. Um, we've had impact in a whole bunch of different ways this year. You know, Tony mentioned the black rail being listed by the federal government as threatened. That's an impact of our work. Um, you now have to disclose if you've made FEMA claims on your home when you're selling it. Mm -hmm. um, I and my colleague Stephen Hopps have written a lot about flooded homes and home disclosure. That's some really good impact. I mean, I think you need to point to solutions and then when things develop in that direction, point it out again and say, you know, look, we're learning from this. Um, I mean, it's it's definitely a scary topic. I'm not gonna pretend it's not, but you know, that there are things we can, you know, address. And that's our job as journalists is to point that out as well. I'm gonna would, try to, oh, go ahead, Tony. I was just gonna echo that because, so that, yeah, this sort of fear-based reporting can have, a backfire effect. And in fact, there's something called the backfire effect that just turns people off. So we really, I, there are a couple of ways, I think, to, to communicate to the public in a more effective way. And, and one is to focus on the now, because that's that's more visceral and, and something you can really think about more deeply. And our brains are sort of hardwired to deal with issues in the moment. And then also for, for with stories that when it's appropriate, like Ghost Bird or the Santee Delta, to, uh, to focus on some universal deeper themes like beauty and mystery and, and, and as a way of just sort of easing people into uh, an issue instead of just freaking them out. So I'm gonna do my best in, uh, as we get to the end of the hour to get through the questions we've gotten quite a few. Um, if we get to the end and we didn't address your question, reach out to us. So um, uh, my email is a Phillips with two L's at postandcourier.com. Um, Chloe's C Johnson uh, at postandcourier.com. Uh, Tony's Tony Bartlemy at postandcourier.com. Uh, reach out to us uh, and we can address anything that we didn't touch on today. So. Let me, let's try. Okay, uh, can you address, uh, maybe this is a good question for Chloe. Can you address if tidal water enters the peninsula from underground tunnels? Oh, that's a, that's a really fascinating question. So um, the city of Charleston has been for a few years now putting in what are called check valves. So these are valves that will let water flow down so that rainwater can drain, but will stop tidal water from seeping up. Um, and that has really improved, you know, this like nuisance flooding in a bunch of places around the peninsula. Some places are still waiting for those valves. So yes, that has definitely happened in Charleston. Um, the, the bigger picture here, which I'm really excited to explore in the new year, is that sea level rise you know, as the seas are rising, the water table is rising at the same time, um, which I think people don't always think about. 
And so then do we reach a point where the water table starts infiltrating our drainage systems and they just don't work as well? Um, this is something that was pointed out in the Dutch dialogues um, that you know the Dutch experts and engineers and folks saw as something that needs to be addressed. Um, so I would say look for some more reporting on that. Uh, this one is uh, addressed to Chloe. Uh, thank you for the recent story on plastic in the ocean and its effect on marine life. Can you also address how or if plastic litter in the ocean also has an effect on climate change and uh, sea rise? That's a really interesting question. I mean, my understanding is that um, there, I don't know that anything about plastic being in the ocean itself changes the level of the ocean, but plastic is a petrochemical product, right? It is coming from companies that, you know, extract natural gas or oil, um, which are products that, you know, have been linked to climate change. So that's kind of a roundabout way of saying, like, maybe it's kind of a symptom of it <laughs> more than anything. Um, I don't think, you know, plastic trash in the ocean is a huge problem biologically, ecologically. I don't know that it's making the ocean get higher, if that's what you were asking. I'm not sure. Thanks. Um, uh, this one's from, for Chloe, too. Uh, I know you're going to be... Um, doing more reporting on the seawall next year. Uh, will you be reporting on how the city has addressed the wall uh, in relationship with the Dutch dialogue? Yeah, I mean, that's this continual question, kind of like I said before, the dialogues did advocate for a perimeter around Charleston of some nature. It was, you know, not terribly specific about what type of perimeter. Um, I, I think I, I have talked to Dale Morris, who was a part of the dialogues process about this early and when this plan came out. And he said, like, yeah, it does fit with the program. I think a lot of people are getting a little held up because Dutch dialogues was a it was much more comprehensive in looking at things the city could do. You know, it talked about water storage, other options, sort of green solutions. And the purview of the core is extremely specific. It is all about hurricane surge. So, um, you know, the city has other projects on its plate that it's going to continue to pursue. Um, but, you know, we will absolutely be writing about um, the city's input in this process. There's going to be a lot, a lot more of that. There was a story earlier this week about a kind of procedural step. Um, the city saying, we'll proceed with this plan, but we want to make some changes. And then there's definitely going to be more reporting on, you know, where the city and um, some consultants they've hired see potential improvements on this plan. Um, this is a logistical question uh, from somebody asking if we're going to make this video publicly accessible. We are recording this. Um, anyone that signed up uh, for this webinar uh, we'll get a recording of this video. This person is suggesting that they want to share it um, with their students. So um, yes, it will it will be available. Um, let's see, this is a comment, a kind of compliment. Um, it says, you don't have to report or discuss fear, but rather present the facts as a way to uh, assess risk. Your reporters do that well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, we need to wind down. I'm going to ask just a kind of closing question uh, to both Tony and Chloe, and then we'll pass it back to uh, PJ, our publisher. So Tony, all this work uh, this year, um, what's your takeaway from 2020? So I think the, the thing that I took away from it is, first of all, that climate change is real. The story is not a that it's changing, it's about the pace of change, that it represents a real threat to the viability of this place, but that there are things that we can do to protect ourselves in the short and long term. All right, Chloe, all the work you've done this year, what's your big takeaway from 2020? You know, my big takeaway is I'm so 
proud of all my colleagues, you know, Tony included on the work that we've done. In the Rising Water series, we had people from the Metro team, the business desk helping us too, um, data visualization, like everyone was engaged on this project. A whole bunch of people were getting water samples and tromping around in floods. And it was just so cool to see that happen. Um, and I'm really proud of it. You know, my other takeaway, and we've talked about this a lot this hour is, you know, focusing on those solutions in the coming year and how we're adapting to this. I mean, this wall project is the biggest, most expensive adaptation project to date in the city of Charleston. So um, I'll be focusing on that um, and looking for ways to sort of, you know, the story is still happening. Climate change is going to keep happening next year. So um, push the story forward and kind of uncover more about it. Thanks. All right, before I say goodbye, uh, in half an hour, you can uh, download Understand SC podcast and hear more about uh, rising waters and subscribe to that podcast. Uh, we're doing new interesting things with it every week. Um, sign up for this newsletter that we're launching. If you're interested in this topic, uh, the first week of February, Chloe will be writing that. Uh, the link is, so I get it right, postandcourier.com forward slash climate change little dash newsletter. Um, and that's it. Thanks for spending your lunch hour with us. Uh, before we go, I want to pass it back to our publisher, uh, PJ Browning, who has some closing remarks. Thank you, Autumn, and a special thank you to Tony and to Chloe. I think you can see that they're very passionate about the work that they do, and we're very fortunate to um, have them on our team. So thank you guys very much. Um, you know, ultimately, we uh, do this work on behalf of our communities, and we really appreciate your support. Uh, we appreciate your readership, um, your thoughts, your questions, your curiosity. And uh, I think uh, maybe Chloe said it uh, best earlier. You know, I think a lot of times we're in this business because of the curiosity we have around topics. And, you know, certainly the, the end game is the improvement that makes the community a better place for all of us to live and work. So um, again, thank you for your time. We do hope to bring you more beyond the headlines and give you a look inside uh, and share some of the thoughts that our very creative and very professional journalists have. So thank you again, enjoy the rest of your week.